Gym Space at Home, the place where you can do science and engineering videos right in the comfort of your own home. I'm your host, Asper Meineke, a mechanical engineer, and in this video we're going to be diving into the microscopic world of germs. Germs are all around us and we come into contact with them every single day without knowing it. Did you know that you come into contact with 60,000 germs a day? These tiny organisms or microbes are so small that we can't see them with our eyes alone and we need special equipment and microscopes to be able to see them. Today I'm talking to one of my friends, Dr. Hilary Staples. She's a scientist that studies a type of germ called viruses and she works at the Texas Biomedical Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. Breakthrough discoveries require sophisticated science. At Texas Biomedical Research Institute, scientific discoveries are made every day. As experts in infectious diseases, our scientists are searching for new diagnostics, treatments, and cures for pathogens such as malaria and tuberculosis to emerging infections like COVID-19. We aim to understand the basic biology of human disease and the microbes that cause them. So welcome Dr. Staples, thank you for joining STEM Space at Home. Can you tell us about what you do and what exactly are viruses? Hi, my name is Hilary Staples and I am a scientist. I study viruses and a scientist that studies viruses is known as a virologist. So what is a virus? Viruses are tiny microscopic little organisms that are unique organized nations of DNA, or RNA, proteins, and fats. So that leads to the question, what is DNA or RNA? Well, these are nucleic acids that all living organisms have, and they're essentially instruction booklets that tell our bodies how to function and how to grow. So it sounds like that all viruses aren't bad. Are they alive? How do they survive? Most virologists agree that viruses are non-living. And this is because they require a host to replicate and perform their biological functions. Without a host, viruses are essentially inert. That means they can't do anything. They can't move around. They can't propel themselves from place to place. They actually have to get into a host in order to be alive. A host is any organism that can be infected by a virus. This includes plants, animals, humans, and even some bacteria. It's also important to know how it is that we can stop them from being able to infect organisms. And that is why a person like me chooses to study viruses and to become a virologist. So I've been hearing a lot about this coronavirus on the news and I know you've been working on it, so could you tell us a little bit about that? Coronavirus was only recently discovered in late 2019. So this is a new coronavirus we've never seen before. Now, there are a lot of different coronaviruses in the world, some that don't infect humans, some that only cause mild disease, and a few that cause pretty nasty disease like the one we're dealing with right now. So the current coronavirus is actually called SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. The disease it causes is COVID-19. So how do we get COVID-19? Well, sars cov 2 is transmitted through respiratory droplets in the air. So if I sneeze or cough or yell and I get respiratory droplets out into the air, the virus can travel in those droplets and be taken in by another person who is nearby. And then that person can get sick as well. It really sounds like we need to do a good job on preventing the spread of this disease. So what kind of work do you do with the coronavirus on a daily basis? What I'm doing today is extracting RNA from um, some previously SARS coronavirus 2 infected samples. Um, and so what I will do once we have the RNA extracted is try and determine how much virus was in each sample through a process called PCR. Um, these samples came out of a special laboratory and have been inactivated, so they're no longer infectious. But even th though they've been inactivated, I do still have to process them in a special piece of equipment called a biosafety cabinet. air 
into it and up through a HEPA filter so that anything I'm processing doesn't come out towards me and I can't breathe it in and get sick. Thanks for showing us a bit of what you do and what it's actually like to work in a science lab. So what can we do to protect ourselves and others from getting COVID-19? We have to make sure we wash our hands really well. We have to socially distance, so staying at least six feet apart from people. It's good for us to wear masks because it keeps our respiratory droplets from going out into the air to be passed on to other people. Um, but these, of course, are not always easy to do. We also have to make sure that we keep our surfaces clean, especially areas that get touched a lot by a lot of different people. Because if the virus lands on those surfaces, they can be picked up when someone touches them and then touches their face. I know that if worn correctly, a mask can actually keep us protected. So can you show us how to properly wear a face mask? So these are very simple um, devices which have um, ear loops here. And so basically you put it on so that it fits directly over your nose and mouth and you take the ear loop on each side and put it over your ear so that it stays in place. And then you kind of have to stretch it out to make sure that the bottom part goes under your chin. And there's a little flexible metal piece here that you can bend over the bridge of your nose and across your cheeks. It's not a perfectly tight seal, but you want it to mold to your face as best you can so that it is catching your respiratory droplets as efficiently as it can. In addition to wearing masks and physically distancing, will there be other new ways in the future for us to protect ourselves? Scientists like me all over the world are working on trying to find more permanent prevention strategies for the coronavirus. That includes vaccines, which are very important. We all don't like them because they're usually shots, but they're important to prevent disease. And sometimes we're also looking for therapeutics, which can treat disease once somebody already has it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Staples, for taking the time to speak with us today. Now that we know the basics of viruses, let's get started with today's engineering design challenge. Your mission is to design a virus protection system to help with physical distancing. So we learned that germs can spread when people come into close contact. And when you go to the grocery store or a restaurant, you come into contact with everybody there. But what if there was a way to pick up groceries or take out food where you didn't come into contact with anyone? Today we are going to build a zipline device to safely transport items from inside of a store directly to your car. For this challenge, you're going to use a ping pong ball to represent our package of food. For the rest of the challenge, you're going to need some paper plates, some straws, tape, scissors, at least nine feet of string, and construction paper. First, you want to set up your zip line with about nine feet of string. You want to take one end of the string and tape it onto a table, a chair, a countertop, and then the end of the string will be taped to the floor or the bottom of a chair. Now that we have a zip line, your challenge is to build a carrier that will hold this ping pong ball and attach to the zip line and allow it to slide down the string. Your design constraints are that the ping pong ball must stay inside the carrying device as it goes down the string. You cannot tape the ping pong ball inside of your device, and your device must go down the string by itself and cannot be pushed. Complete this challenge using the engineering design process. Once you have the materials, brainstorm some ideas on a sheet of paper and start to build. Don't worry about it being perfect. You can always change it once you start building it. Once you have an idea, start building and testing your design. To test it, you want to place your ping pong ball in the carrier at the highest point of the zip line, and then you want to let go and see if it successfully slides down the zip line without stopping and without pushing the ping pong ball out. If you have some trouble with your design, here's some tips. If the ball falls out, this might be because the device is unbalanced. So try adding some weights to balance it out and correct the center of gravity. Or if your device gets stuck going down the zip line, maybe change the material that is sliding down the zip line so it will have less friction. Also, more weight will cause your carrier to move down the line faster. Best of luck engineers, I cannot wait to see your designs. Don't forget to share them to social media using hashtag stemspaceathome on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I hope you enjoyed today's video and see you next time.